Welcome to the Change Log episode 0.3.1. I'm Adam Stachowiak. And I'm Wynn Netherland. This is the Change Log. We cover what's fresh and new in the world of open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also on the web at thechangelog.com. Also head to github.com forward slash explore. You'll find some trendy repos, some feature repos from our blog in the audio podcasts. If you're on Twitter, follow Change Log Show, not the Change Log. And I'm Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P E N G W I N N. Fun episode this week talking web sockets with some experts in the area. Peter over at Yahoo, Martin from Pusher App, and Guillermo from Socket.io, along with guest host Michael Smith from Way Down Under again. Yeah, well, that's a nice lineup there. Yeah, Michael's got a project node WebSocket server that is an implementation of WebSocket server side. So I guess we should mention what WebSockets are. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> it's a persistent connection between the browser and the server so that you can do server push down to the browser and they can just open that long running connection and it's more two way bidirectional communication between client and server without having to do long polling or ajax techniques like what we currently do right so the idea, the idea is to move away from the ajax piece of it speed it up and be more native yeah it's a especially as more and more apps are are poised to go real time this is a just the ever evolving landscape of of web development cool fun episode this week should we get to it let's do it All right, we're joined today by Peter, Martin, and Guillermo, and Michael Smith to talk about HTML5 web sockets. Before we dive right in, let's go around the horn and each of you introduce yourself, kind of what you do in the landscape of web sockets, where you work, and your role there. Peter, let's start with you. Uh, so I'm Peter Grice. I work at uh, Yahoo. I'm a principal engineer. I work on Mail. Uh, we're looking at using web sockets for a couple of different things. Uh, we don't have anything in production yet because obviously web sockets is pretty new, but we're looking at using it for adding uh, different real-time features to mail, message notifications, other things like that, and also uh, doing some experiments with using it to accelerate uh, attachment uploads. All right, Martin. Hi there. Um, I work at a company called New Bamboo. We're, um, we're a Ruby shop in London. Um, so as well as client projects, we've got a few products that we're, we're working on at the moment. Uh, one of those um, is called Pusher App, and uh, the idea of Pusher App is making it really simple. Um, for, for people to be able to push events to browsers. Um, we have an API which you push events to, and those are then uh, via a PubSub model sent to, sent to browsers. Um, we've used this um, internally on a, few of our, on a few of our client projects and, um, and our other products, and uh, it's been working really nicely. Um, I should say WebSockets. Um, we're using, we, we use WebSockets to implement Pusher App. Guillermo? Hello, uh, my name is Guillermo Rauch. I'm the uh, CTO of LearnBoost, uh, an education startup in San Francisco. And I created Socket.io, which is uh, two projects. One is the, uh, a client that provides a WebSocket-like API on, on the browser that um, basically gives you WebSocket um, and a bunch of other different transports um, in, a way, in, this, in a way that like jQuery provides dollar Ajax and they give you XML and HTTP requests for standard compliant browsers and ActiveX object for Internet Explorer. I do the same thing for many different browsers and many different uh, transports. But the developer thinks it's a WebSocket-like API. On the uh, server side, I created socket.io-node, which is an implementation of all these different types of requests um, so that you also develop in like as if you were receiving data from a socket. Perfect. So regular listens of, listeners of the changelog will know that uh, we normally cover projects on the podcast, but sometimes we, we take a step back and cover broader topics, and we'll dive into some of your projects in just a moment. But uh, Michael, why don't you give an overview for those that might not know what WebSockets is and why it should get us excited? Okay, sure. WebSockets are a new piece of technology that, uh, currently falling under the umbrella term of HTML5. They're basically a way to get bi-directional communication between your web browser and a server, and there's no need for opening up, constantly opening up new connections or things like that. So very fast, very real-time, uh, quite similar to almost having a TCP socket, although there's a bit more to it than that. And currently we've got browser support in Safari, Chrome, 
Firefox 4 is coming, I've heard, and same with an internal build of Opera. Uh, I haven't heard anything on Internet Explorer support, but we can only hope. So speaking of support for additional browsers, I guess both in Socket.io and Push Your App, you guys are doing some some fallback techniques for older browsers. Martin, why don't you speak for a moment what you guys are doing in Push Your App for those? Right. Uh, we, we, we actually use a, a library which... Um, which uh, well, sorry, I'll start again. Um, we actually use a library that... Uh, it's called. I need to look it up. Actually, sorry. Uh, feel free to go first on web on Socket IO. Oh, yeah, sorry, for time, yeah. Okay. Guillermo, why don't you jump over yeah. and take that? Sure. Um, the way that Socket IO works on the client, it uses feature detection for um, deciding what transport to use. So, if the WebSocket constructor is there, it'll of course use WebSocket. And on the server side, um, Node will trigger an upgrade event based on the, uh, this handshake that is produced. And, uh, and of course, the communication will happen normally like any other WebSocket server. However, uh, like uh, Michael said, um, there is limited support for WebSocket today. And uh, so we have to resort to other transports. Um, an example is um, called HTML5, uh, which is an iframe that is inserted into an ActiveX object component so that the um, spinner in the browser is not triggered when fetching data from an iframe. Um, so this is all done transparently by Socket.io, and this technique was actually discovered by, um, or made popular by uh, the Gmail chat engineers a few years back. And um, that's the sort of thing that Socket.io solves for you. So how does that differ from uh, Push Your App, Martin? Yeah, so uh, what we do on Pusher App is we use a library called WebSocket.js, um, which um, uses a Flash socket to emulate um, to emulate a WebSocket. Effectively, it 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 it, cre- it connects to the WebSocket server using all the same handshakes as uh, as a real uh, browser initiated WebSocket, and it exposes the same API in JavaScript. Um, so we 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 sense whether the WebSocket. Um, is available at the browser level. If not, we use the WebSocket JS. And uh, what we also do is, is we in first initiate a, a non-secure, a non-TLS WebSocket connection um, that fails for a, for for a large number of proxies, intermediary proxies, uh, which we probably come onto in future. And um, we fall back to a secure WebSocket in those cases. And we'll put this in the show notes, but it looks like WebSocket.js is another open source project like Socket.io. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, Peter. Yeah. How actually, actually, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, Socket.io also uses Flash Socket if Flash is available. So, like I said, using feature detection, I can know if the if the uh, client has Flash installed and ready to use, and I pick that one. So, Socket.io has also a priority list based on how. Uh, bi-directional the transports are. So it will try with WebSocket first, it will try with Flash second, which might fail uh, if the client is behind the proxy because the WebSocket um, protocol um, in in their draft specifies using the uh, connect HTTP method to bypass proxies. This cannot be done by Flash because Flash doesn't have the information, the authentication information of the proxy is not given to Flash by the by the user agent. So Flash WebSocket JS will fail behind proxies. In that case, Socket.io will fall back to other transports like long polling, HTML file, which are not which have um, higher latency and that's why they are lower on the list of priority. So from an architecture standpoint, how would uh, WebSockets differ for something like traditional long polling? Well, um, this is what essentially Socket.io solves. Those two methods of communication are like really different. Um, in one, you have you know that the socket will be open, and you have three events: connect, disconnect, and message. And with long polling, you essentially have many disconnections on the uh, request side. So there is a chance that the server might try to send a message to the client, and the client is temporarily disconnected, or he's between reconnections. So a long polling request is closed. The server tries to send a message before the client opens another. One. So that's another thing that Socket.io does. It buffers messages that are sent between these disconnections by the client, and when the client reconnects, it sends him a buffer 
a chunk of messages while he was temporarily disconnected, which might be a couple of milliseconds or, I don't know, depending on the client's connection, it can be a long time. Can I ask you a quick question, Guillermo? Um, how do you manage to, uh, if, you, if you're going to scale this and uh, you need more than one Node.js server, um, do you have to make sure that the request is sticky so the, the reconnection comes back to the same process in order for that buffering to work? Or, or how do you do exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah, for now, it's a single process. Uh, of course, you can put a message queue or a Redis server in front of it, and uh, you can make you can make it scale to different nodes in terms of like uh, since the information you deal with will be in one process, um, scaling takes a little more work, um, but uh, it's definitely possible. Uh, so another thing uh, you could do is uh, use an HTTP load balancer to direct a request to a particular server instance, um, either using um, any of the headers that are in there or um, inspecting other properties of the request. Um, typically, this is harder to do on, um, you know, if there are multiple processes on a single box, but uh, if your router is smart enough or if you have enough routing smarts in the manager on the box itself, you can do that uh, without actually needing to have a separate uh, data store like a Redis or whatever. Yeah, we're actually um, we're actually using a, a load balancer called HA Proxy uh, for Pusher App, um, which we find works extremely well. Um, we're using it in layer four mode, but uh, uh, you can um, it it allows you to do a lot of the sticky sessions support that kind of thing. Okay, so if you were to do uh, load balancing within, say, Node, how would you go about doing it? Would you still use that load balancing server or would you use some other technique? Uh, you might want to answer that, Peter. Uh, sure. So um, there are a couple of different ways of doing it within Node. Uh, a lot of the frameworks that exist today, like Connect or Multi-Node, um, are both good at uh, distributing incoming connections among a bunch of different processes. Uh, for these guys, uh, they don't have any support for uh, stickiness at all. So any incoming request has, uh, you know, a relatively equal chance of being served by any of the processes. So that doesn't really get you what you want. Um, what you can do instead is uh, accept all connections in one process, uh, read part of the request enough of, from the enough of the request to know uh, which process should be serving it, uh, and then go and send the socket and the part of your request that you saw off to the right worker. Um, I have a blog post up on how to do this that it can probably go out in the show notes or something, but. Um, you know, you, you can use that technique. Is there anything intrinsically browser dependent as far as the client side? Because I know, um, you know, XHR really took off, you know, it made Ajax possible, right? Um, but I've seen that same technique, the asynchronous calls in iPhone applications that are native applications. Would this be something that someday may be used in a native mobile device? Okay, currently there is support in well, sort of support in uh, iPhone libraries. Uh, there's, I think, two projects that give you the headers required to include WebSockets within your iPhone app, although I don't think they're currently supported. Uh, I think they were drafted for iPhone 4, but they didn't make it in in time, so I might have more information on that. Uh, as for the browser side... The main thing that needs to be done is for A, the browsers to implement the protocol and then to make sure that they actually communicate and use it and actually do the communication of the protocol with the server in uh, the proper ways. So Guillermo and, and Martin, what types of applications are you guys seeing being built with Socket.io and with Pusher App? Uh, I've heard of a couple different ones. Um, there are some projects that build on top of Socket.io to give you like APIs to build different things more easily um, because essentially Socket.io only gives you the Socket API. So you need to do a little more uh, to build an application. Although you, you can build a thin protocol based on JSON, pass JSON messages, and like have a chat application like the example that ships with Socket.io. Uh, a really interesting one is called Dnode, uh, which does asynchronous remote method invocation. Uh, this was created by the um, Stack VM guys. And um, 
Uh, it's built on top of Socket.io, and it's a good w base for building applications. Um, I've also seen um, I've seen a chat application with uh, video enabled by Flash and avatars that move on the screen. Um, I've seen an Asteroids game built with Socket.io, and recently I heard of um, someone trying to build a drawing application which was passing many, many messages uh, by many people at the same time. Socket.io used to rely on JSON for doing message buffering, so it would send you an array of messages and it would be parsed by JSON. That turned out to be like very CPU intensive and it's been since removed in 0 0.5, which was released uh, this week. Uh, so uh, today it's suitable for many different applications from games to uh, uh, chat applications or uh, tying your data model to uh, making your, your data alive on the browser with something like Dnode. From my point of view, um, the, the way Pusher App actually came about was that we had a, a, a an application called True Story, um, which is a, a, a collaborative application to manage a, an agile backlog. And what we wanted is that, that we wanted... Um, so you could have edit stories uh, in one browser, and those, those stories would be the changes would be reflected in another browser. Um, you could drag and drop, reorder, change sprints, and that kind of thing. And so we actually that's one of the reasons that Pusher exposes a kind of event binding API. So in the in the browser where the event was being changed, or where, sorry, where the story was being changed, we'd trigger a um, an, an update call would would go to your, you know, Rails application or whatever, and that would send a story updated event on on the channel um, to all the subscribers, all the people who are viewing the backlog in their browsers. Um, so we, we've seen some people do application, you know, collaborative applications like that. Um, the other thing we've seen a lot of in, on Pusher is uh, people who have um, just using Pusher because it's so easy to to, to send data out. Um, to browsers, so real-time Twitter feeds, uh, um, just just real-time information. Um, group Dashpon is one example where um, real-time um, um, purchases on Groupon are displayed on Google Maps, for example. Um, another example we've got is, a, is another drawing application where where um, users can draw pictures on their iPad, and uh, those 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 drawings are shown in real time on the web. That's that's called a web pad. Martin, talk a moment about channels and pusher, and uh, how many channels would I have in a an application? Is my app a channel, or would I have multiple channels in my app? It very much depends, actually, on the application. For example, the application I spoke about, uh, Group Dashpon, um, that would that I believe has a single channel, um, which is Groupon purchases. So everybody who's viewing that web page would be on would be subscribed to that channel. So there could be potentially hundreds of, of users subscribed to a one channel um, and pushing information out efficiently to all of those users via a single API call. Um, in the True Story collaborative application, there might be a single channel per uh, backlog. So um, you might, in, in your web application, you, predict, you have domain objects which uh, you want to share their state um, Share state on those domain objects with 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 other users. Um, so to, there may there may be I don't know uh, ten people using the application at the same time. Um, each you know two of them each viewing each backlog. So there would be a, a, a channel for each of those. But but typically we're we're seeing it. It's not uh, that there is. In most cases, we don't have a single channel per user. It's a it's a channel per object which people collaborate on or are interested in. Okay, so I should also note that the channels that Martin is speaking of, they're not actually built into the WebSocket protocol, but rather a layer on top of them, which I think you're still using uh, URL-based routing or something? Um, no, well, what we, what we do, we started with that approach, you're right. Um, the way we do it at the moment is that once the WebSocket is connected, um, the the, the JavaScript sends um, sends a JSON event. Um, I mean, it's a, it's just JSON, but it's it's in a uh, it has an event name which is uh, push a subscribe um, and the name of the channel. And then internally in the socket server, we then 
subscribe to, to the queue that publishes those events. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. Channels are an abstraction which we've added on top of WebSockets. Um, and the other abstraction we've added is the, the idea of um, being able to trigger events and have those events then triggered in JavaScript. So it's, it's just a matter of saying push a dot .bind event name and then the anonymous, anonymous function which you want to be executed. But you're absolutely right. These are, these are things that we've added on because that's um, our applications. They, they all needed that kind of thing. Okay, so going off the idea of triggering events and things like that, there's also a new HTML5... Uh, there's also a new HTML5 uh, protocol which is called Event Source, uh, which allows you to trigger events on the browser from the server. I'm not sure if it's bi-directional. Uh, Peter, would you have any more information on that? Or uh, I wish I did. Okay. The way I understand it is uh, event source is pretty much a, a one-way WebSocket. Oh, that's the idea. From, from, a, yeah. from a JavaScript API point of view, that's what you get. So you can so only uh, receive events okay. from the server. You can't push events to the server. Right, exactly. So the way that you send messages to the server is actual like normal AJAX. Uh, it's very similar to the multi-part flag in the XML HTTP request object, which is only supported by Firefox. That gives you that is also implemented by Socket.io, and that gives you a single way we could say WebSocket, a connection that is always open and pushing parts of messages. Um, uh, in that respect, event source is very similar to it. Um, and it's my understanding that it's only implemented in Opera uh, so far. I'm not sure. You know, sometimes the technology comes along and it forces us to take a, a fresh look at how we solve some problems. I know the NoSQL database movement has done that for me and that now when I model my data in the database, it really changes the way I look at the application as a whole. Uh, Peter, talk about what WebSockets does to how you architect applications at, at Yahoo. Uh, sure. So um, what we're interested in uh, with WebSockets is, you know, once browsers actually support this thing, it'll provide a first class API that you can always use and always expect to work as opposed to um, going jumping through all the hoops that Guillermo has done a, a great job of doing and building a library that can kind of handle all the different browser use cases, proxy use cases, um, different performance and connection limitations that different browsers have. You know, there's kind of a whole world of stuff that you need to try to navigate um, with the current set of um, ways that you can have this kind of full duplex communication. You know, it is doable now, and, and Guillermo stuff uh, is, um, you know, kind of living proof of that. But the promise of WebSockets is... Um, a unified API that uh, you can expect to work at least in some number, small, really small number of years once browser and proxy support um, is there for that. Before we go around the horn and ask uh, what's on each of your open source radars, uh, Michael, why don't you give a shout out for your own WebSocket server and then kind of list some resources that the WebSocket noob, including myself, could, could go and check out. Okay, so I do actually write my own WebSocket server. Uh, Node WebSocket server. It's different to Guelmero's in that rather than adding support for all the backwards compatible uh, transport methods, it just gives you the WebSocket connections. Um, and then as for resources, probably the best place to find out more about WebSockets would have to be uh, the protocol outline, which is in the Watwig working group, well, yeah, web apps working group, which is sort of part of the W3C, but not really. Uh, and they're the ones authoring the specification, which is uh, being led by Ian Hickson at the moment. Uh, then you, there's also a fair few other resources uh, that we'll link to in the show notes. I don't have uh, URLs offhand. Uh, so, yeah. Of course, socket.io and, and pusherapp.com, right? Well, this yeah. is the uh, part of the episode where we kind of turn it upside down and, and um, ask what's on our guest, Open Source Radars. We'll start with you, Guillermo. What open source projects uh, have got you excited and that you want to go play with? Well, um, I don't know if you've guys seen the uh, Hummingbird demo for Node, which is basically uh, WebSocket and MongoDB for real-time analytics. 
Um, we're actually also users of MongoDB and we developed our own ORM. Um, and what we're hoping to release in the upcoming months is an easy way to build um, web applications that have data displaying on the browser, which is updated all the time based, based on socket IO and server push, uh, and of course, real time. Um, aside from that, uh, in general, I think uh, it's interesting to watch all the uh, Node.js related uh, projects since Node makes it really easy to build this kind of like real time uh, applications and modules. What about you, Martin? I think the, uh, the, the thing that's really exciting me at the moment is Redis. Um, all the projects I've worked on recently, I've used Redis in, um, and it's, it's just incredibly liberating to have a, a really fast um, atomic data store in, um, that I can share between multiple processes. Um, another open source, uh, I should, should mention that we're, we're using uh, EM WebSocket, which is, a, which is a Ruby. If you're interested in a Ruby event machine um, client, then um, that's, a, that's a great one to look at. Peter? Uh, a couple things. Um, so the Node.js YUI3 bindings are, I think, really exciting because... Um, they let you have this really rich set of tools that you can run both on browser and on the server. And for doing things that you would normally only really think about doing in the browser, like you can take these really complex web applications written in YUI and decide that you're going to render them statically on the server if the client has low bandwidth and you don't want to deal with downloading all the JavaScript or the client it has a CPU that's not particularly strong and so you just want to hand it some static HTML and make life really easy for it. So I think that provides a really kind of compelling platform for building uh, user experiences that can handle a wide variety of clients. Um, another thing that I'm that I'm starting to watch and is actually really new and I think is an interesting fit for WebSockets is um, is Telehash. Uh, this is uh, Jeremy Miller, the creator of XMPP. Uh, this is his uh, distributed uh, JSON uh, routing protocol. Uh, it's really, really early going right now. You know, there's only a basic protocol up and a couple of really kind of bare bones implementations, but it looks like a really uh, kind of neat way of shooting around data. With all of these tools, do you think the application landscape for the web developers getting easier or more complicated? Uh, I mean, you know, some things are easier, you know, uh, the, you know, in some sense, the promise of, of WebSockets is it will become easy to uh, build these real-time full duplex pipes, uh, whereas now it is possible, but it's just hard. Um, so, you know, there, uh, there are, I guess, more choice uh, does make things difficult to some extent, but, uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and we'll see you in cyberspace.